Hello everyone and welcome to our module on ACLS and tachycardias. Let's start by talking about cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest is when the left ventricle stops pumping blood, causing a drop in blood pressure that leads to a patient collapsing. The technical definition is the sudden cessation of cardiac activity with hemodynamic collapse. And usually when people have a cardiac arrest, it's because they have developed one of four underlying cardiac rhythms, and I've shown all four of these on the screen here. First one is ventricular tachycardia, second one is ventricular fibrillation, third one is called pulseless electrical activity, or PEA. This means that QRS complexes are being generated, but there is no pulse, that's why it's called pulseless. And then the final one is called asystole. So patients who have any pathologic process that leads to one of these four rhythms will often collapse, and that's called a cardiac arrest. ACLS stands for Advanced Cardiac Life Support, and this is the algorithm, in other words, the steps that you follow when you are treating someone who has a life-threatening cardiac emergency like cardiac arrest. Generally, the ACLS protocol is a series of clinical steps that are taken when you encounter an unresponsive patient. This is a picture of people practicing the ACLS protocol on the dummy here. You can see that this man is doing chest compressions. Someone else is using a bag to ventilate the patient. And these are all components of the ACLS protocol for treating life-threatening cardiac emergencies. Generally, the ACLS protocol is applied when you encounter a patient who is unresponsive and has no pulse. And when this happens, the first thing that you want to do is call for help. And this often comes up on board exams. They will describe an unresponsive patient. The correct answer of what to do first is not deliver a shock or administer a drug. It's always to call for help. And that's because you want more than one person present when you're trying to resuscitate a patient. After this, the next step is to start chest compressions. This is also called CPR or cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And what you're doing when you compress the chest is you are squeezing the left ventricle and forcing it to pump blood. Basically, you are doing the work of the heart because the heart is unable to do that due to cardiac arrest. After CPR, you want to apply oxygen. And then finally, you want to attach a heart monitor and defibrillator. This is an image on the screen of a heart monitor defibrillator. These are found throughout hospitals. And this step is very important because what you're going to do from this point forward is going to depend on the underlying heart rhythm that is present in the patient. Once you've done those four steps on the last slide, the next thing you want to do is examine the patient's cardiac rhythm on the monitor and determine whether or not it is shockable. What do I mean by shockable? Well, these two cardiac rhythms on the left side of the screen, ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, are shockable. That means you can deliver an electric shock to the chest of the patient and potentially restore normal sinus rhythm and normal cardiac output. And that's why one of the first things you want to do is apply a monitor and see if the patient has one of these two rhythms. If the patient does not have one of those two rhythms, if instead they have PEA or asystole, these rhythms are not shockable and therefore you don't want to administer a shock. Shown on this slide is the ACLS algorithm for the management of patients with cardiac arrest. When you're treating a patient with cardiac arrest, the goal of treatment is to achieve return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC. And you'll hear this term used clinically so you should be familiar with it. So when you encounter a patient who has cardiac arrest, the first thing you want to do is all the things we've already talked about. You want to call for help, you want to place the patient on a monitor, and you want to begin CPR. The next steps after this depend on the underlying rhythm. If the underlying rhythm is ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia, then the next step is to shock. On the other hand, if the underlying rhythm is asystole or PEA, a shock is not advised because these are non-shockable rhythms. In patients with V-fib or pulseless VT, after you deliver a shock, if you achieve return of spontaneous circulation, then you stop. If, however, the rhythm persists and the patient remains in cardiac arrest, then you want to go back to doing CPR. Because remember, when you're not doing CPR, you're not circulating blood through the patient's body. As you're doing CPR, you stop every two minutes to check the rhythm. If the rhythm remains VT or pulseless VF, then you want to shock again. In addition, while you're doing these rhythm checks and repeat shocks, you can administer epinephrine every three to five minutes. And amiodarone is used in refractory cases to try and terminate the ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. In contrast, if you have a patient with asystole, you don't deliver a shock, as we already said. You continue CPR. You can administer epinephrine every three to five minutes and do rhythm checks just like you do in patients with V-fib or VT. And then beyond these things, the mainstay of treating asystole or PEA is to try and identify a reversible cause that you can stop to try and get the patient to have a return of spontaneous circulation. So shown on this slide are the reversible causes of cardiac arrest. Most of these are fairly obvious. Patients who have severe hypovolemia or hypoxia can have a cardiac arrest. Acidosis and potassium abnormalities can cause cardiac arrest. Severe hypothermia can cause cardiac arrest. And then a number of pathologic conditions are sometimes associated with cardiac arrest. These include 
myocardial infarction, tension pneumo, cardiac tamponade, and pulmonary embolism. So in real life, when you're running a code and following the ACLS algorithm, what you want to do in the back of your mind is think about the patient and think about which one of these underlying reversible causes may have led to the patient's cardiac arrest. If you can figure out, for example, that the patient is likely severely volume depleted, then you can treat that by giving volume. Same thing for some of these other causes listed on this slide. So when I'm involved in a cardiac arrest, I'm making sure that someone is doing chest compressions, that we're checking the rhythm and delivering shocks. But while that's going on, in parallel, I'm thinking about these causes on this slide to see if one of them is likely to have caused the patient's cardiac arrest, and therefore, if one of them is potentially treatable. Now let's talk about ventricular tachycardia in a little bit more detail. Some patients who develop ventricular tachycardia are stable, and by this I mean their pulse is intact and the patient remains awake, and they have no evidence of hemodynamic compromise, things like hypotension or chest pain. If you encounter this situation, what you want to do is administer intravenous amiodarone, or alternatively, you can use other antiarrhythmic drugs like lidocaine or procainamide. But the most important thing to remember is that you do not want to perform a cardioversion. In other words, you do not want to administer a shock when a patient is conscious. You should never, never do this. And this often comes up on the board exams. They describe a patient with stable VT who is conscious. Even though VT is a shockable rhythm, you never shock patients when they're conscious because it is extremely painful. The correct answer for treatment of stable VT is to administer intravenous amiodarone or another antiarrhythmic. In real life, patients with stable VT sometimes pass out, so you can wait until they lose consciousness and then you can shock them, or you can administer anesthesia like propofol and then shock them, but the important thing is to never, never shock a patient who is conscious. Polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is a subtype of ventricular tachycardia where the QRS complex morphology varies over time. If you look at the bottom right side of the screen, this is an example of monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. You can see that all the QRS complexes have the same shape. On the left side of the screen is an example of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. You can see that the QRS complexes change over time. Patients with polymorphic VT usually have multiple foci of abnormal electrical activity in the ventricle, and that's why all those multiple foci generate QRS complexes that change over time. It's an unstable rhythm that can lead to cardiac arrest, just like any form of ventricular tachycardia, and it's treated the same way as other forms of ventricular tachycardia. And usually, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia occurs in patients who have myocardial ischemia. So, for example, a patient with a STEMI can have ischemia to the entire anterior wall of the left ventricle. That often leads to polymorphic VT with lots of abnormal foci of electrical activity in the ventricle. Torsade de Plance is a special subtype of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. That occurs in patients who have a prolonged QT segment on their surface ECG. If you look at the bottom right side of the screen here, this is an example of a very prolonged QT interval. So the QT interval begins at the onset of the QRS interval and it ends at the end of the T wave. And a normal QT interval is about four to 500 milliseconds. This patient's QT interval is over 600 milliseconds. It's over three big boxes wide, and that is severely prolonged. And patients can develop a prolonged QT interval if they have abnormalities of potassium or calcium, or if they are taking certain drugs, especially certain antiarrhythmic drugs. When the QT interval becomes prolonged, patients are at risk for developing this arrhythmia, torsade de Plance, which is a subtype of polymorphic VT. It's called torsade de Plance because that term means twisting of the points, and you can see that the QRS complexes go from very large to very small, and that is believed to look like a twisting of the points. And basically, this is just a special subtype of ventricular tachycardia, and you treat it the way you would treat any form of ventricular tachycardia. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, you administer urgent defibrillation. The one special thing about torsades that you should know, especially for your boards, though, is that when patients have recurrent episodes, you can treat this with intravenous magnesium sulfate. For reasons that are poorly understood, magnesium sulfate works to suppress torsade de Plance. This is the only arrhythmia where we use it. So, in a board question of a patient having this arrhythmia, who has a history of something causing their QT segment to be prolonged, the right answer is often magnesium sulfate. So lots of cardiac arrests happen outside the hospital, and when this occurs, there's often no one around to perform CPR and resuscitate the patient. So many times, patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest do not survive. In terms of your board exams, what you want to always remember is that the time to resuscitation is the strongest predictor of survival of an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. If there is someone around to begin resuscitation in a short period of time, that leads to improved survival. If it's a long time until someone responds to the cardiac arrest, there's a poor prognosis. This is the most important factor to determine whether or not patients survive. And then beyond this, there are many other poor prognostic signs. I've listed a couple of them on this slide. 
If the initial rhythm is PA or asystole, that's a bad prognostic sign. If spontaneous circulation does not return after five minutes of CPR, that's a bad sign. And then, of course, advanced age is also a bad prognostic sign. Now let's talk about evaluating tachycardic rhythms in unstable patients. So when we say a patient is hemodynamically unstable, usually what we mean is they have hypotension or chest pain or respiratory distress of acute onset. And when one of these things is going on, the patient often has a fast heart rate. In other words, they have a tachycardia. Now in clinical practice, sorting this out is tricky business because the tachycardia could be causing the patient to be unstable or the tachycardia could be a consequence of the instability. For example, a patient who is hemorrhaging will have a tachycardia. The tachycardia is not making them sick. It is a response to the hemorrhage. On the other hand, a patient with ventricular tachycardia can be hemodynamically unstable, and the hemodynamic instability is coming totally from the arrhythmia. So determining whether or not a tachycardia is the cause or a consequence of hemodynamic instability is beyond the scope of this video. But what I want to point out to you here is that when you're evaluating a tachycardia in an unstable patient, a key distinction is whether or not the tachycardia is associated with a wide or a narrow QRS complex. So here's a slide on the QRS interval. And recall that this interval starts at the beginning of the QRS complex and ends at the end of the QRS complex. And a normal QRS interval is less than 120 milliseconds, which is three small boxes wide. And a normal QRS interval is narrow, like you see here. It's nice and narrow. Some causes of a wide QRS interval are shown on this slide. First of all, if you have a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block, that will make the QRS complex wide. And hopefully you can appreciate, even without measuring it, that this is a wider QRS complex than the narrow one up here at the top of the screen. Same is true for the left bundle branch block. Hopefully you can appreciate that this is a wide QRS complex compared to a narrow one. And then the final cause of a wide QRS complex is ventricular tachycardia, which we've already been talking about. So all of these QRS complexes are wide. None of them look narrow like the normal QRS. So when you're assessing an unstable patient who has a tachycardia, the first thing you want to do is decide whether or not you think the QRS complex in that tachycardia is wide or narrow, because that is going to help you to determine what the cause of the tachycardia is and how to treat the patient. So when we say a patient has a wide complex tachycardia, we mean that they have a rapid heart rate and a QRS complex that is wide, meaning greater than 120 milliseconds. And there are basically two broad categories of causes of wide complex tachycardias, and you can differentiate one from the other on the ECG. The first cause is ventricular tachycardia, like I've shown on the slide here. The second cause is a supraventricular tachycardia with an aberrancy like a left bundle branch block or right bundle branch block. So for example, imagine that a patient has a left bundle branch block and they develop sinus tachycardia from exercise. Well, they are going to have a wide complex tachycardia like what I've shown on the screen here. And obviously the treatment of sinus tachycardia is very different from the treatment of ventricular tachycardia. So an advanced ECG topic, something beyond the scope of medical students, something more in line with the cardiology boards, is using the ECG to differentiate ventricular tachycardia from sinus tachycardia with an aberrancy like a bundle branch block. They're not going to ask you to do this on step two or step three, but I just want you to be aware that the differential for a wide complex tachycardia is ventricular tachycardia or SVT, the barency. And in terms of your board exams, if they describe a patient with a sudden onset of a wide complex tachycardia and the patient is unstable, the answer is generally always to shock. In real life, it's more complicated, but in a board exam, when they're describing something like this, they usually are describing ventricular tachycardia. In contrast, narrow complex tachycardias have a rapid heart rate with a narrow or normal QRS interval that's less than 120 milliseconds. This is a narrow complex tachycardia shown on the screen here, and hopefully you can appreciate that these QRS intervals are not wide. When the QRS interval is narrow, it always means that the rhythm is originating above the ventricle. It could be coming from the sinus node, like sinus tachycardia. It could be coming from the atria, like atrial fibrillation, or it could be coming from the AV node, like AV nodal arrhythmias. And because all narrow complex tachycardias originate above the ventricle, we often call them supraventricular tachycardias or SVTs. And there are many causes of SVTs, things like sinus tachycardia, atrial fibrillation and flutter, atrial tachycardia, and AVNRT, which we'll talk about later, in addition to other arrhythmias. The treatment is always based on the underlying cause, and you have to learn how to interpret ECGs to differentiate one of these arrhythmias from another. And once again, in terms of your board exams, if they describe a patient with the sudden onset of an SVT and the patient is unstable, the answer is almost always to shock. That's because many forms of SVT will convert to sinus rhythm if you deliver an electrical shock. And so that's what you want to do when someone is unstable with a sudden onset SVT.
So that's a nice segue into talking about electrical cardioversion. Electrical cardioversion is the delivery of electricity to the heart to try to terminate a pathologic rhythm and restore sinus rhythm. And there are two ways this can be done. One is called unsynchronized and one is called synchronized. Unsynchronized cardioversion is also referred to as defibrillation. This involves delivery of a high energy shock that is delivered to the heart immediately when you press the buttons on the machine. And this is used for life-threatening arrhythmias like ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia. These patients are at risk of death and therefore you want to deliver a high energy shock because high energy shocks are more likely to work and you want to deliver them right away when you press the buttons. You don't want any delay. The other type of cardioversion is called synchronized. In this form of cardioversion, a low energy shock is delivered and the machine synchronizes the shock so that it's delivered during a QRS complex. The idea here is to avoid shocking during the T wave, which can cause heart rhythms to convert to ventricular fibrillation. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, this is a rhythm strip with rapid atrial fibrillation. And if you saw this rhythm on the defibrillator machine and you press the sync button, the machine will place arrows over every QRS complex. And what that means is the machine is trying to tell you that it's recognizing the QRS complexes. And when you press the button, it's going to wait for the next QRS complex to deliver the shock. And then it will deliver that low energy shock. So this is the preferred way to cardiovert SVTs. The reason is supraventricular tachycardias are generally less dangerous than ventricular tachycardias and you don't want to convert them into ventricular fibrillation. So if you're delivering a shock for an unstable SVT or a stable SVT, like atrial fibrillation or flutter, that's when you use synchronization. The only other time we use synchronization is in patients who have stable ventricular tachycardia, like I talked about before. You can also use the synchronized shock in those situations. Remember that the unsynchronized shocks, which are also referred to as defibrillation, those are reserved for situations where patients have life-threatening arrhythmias like V-fib and pulseless VT. I'll finish this module by talking about PSVTs. A PSVT is a paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, and a PSVT is a special kind of SVT. In a PSVT, there is a tachycardia that is a regular supraventricular rhythm that has an abrupt onset and also usually an abrupt offset. If you look at the bottom of the screen, this is an ECG example of a PSVT. So at the beginning of the ECG, this patient has a normal sinus rhythm. And then there is the abrupt onset of a regular supraventricular tachycardia, and that is the definition of a PSVT. And PSVTs are distinguished from other types of SVTs because of the fact that they have an abrupt onset and they are regular. So for example, sinus tachycardia is not a PSVT. That's because sinus tachycardia does not start from one beat to the next. It has a slow onset. When you exercise, you develop sinus tachycardia, but it doesn't occur in one heartbeat. Slowly, your heart rate rises as you're exercising, and therefore sinus tach is not a PSVT. Atrial fibrillation is also not a PSVT because atrial fibrillation is irregular and not regular. So PSVTs are the special subtype of SVTs that have a regular rhythm and an abrupt onset. And when they occur, they often cause palpitations. That's the most common symptom that patients with PSVTs complain about. Rarely, they can cause chest pain, and even more rarely, they can cause people to faint or have hypotension. So a PSVT is a sudden onset regular supraventricular tachycardia, but there are many underlying causes of PSVT. But the most common cause of a PSVT is AVNRT. AVNRT stands for atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia. It's the most common cause of a PSVT. And in order to develop AVNRT, you need to have dual AV nodal pathways. So what do I mean by that? I want you to look at the right side of the screen, and I want you to imagine that everything in yellow here is the AV node of a patient. And then I want you to imagine that up at the top we have the atria, and down at the bottom we have the His bundle conducting electricity to the ventricles. People who develop AVNRT have dual pathways in their AV node. That means that there are some fibers that conduct electricity slowly and some fibers that conduct electricity quickly or fast. And what can happen under the right circumstances is that an electrical impulse can go slowly down the slow pathway and then find the fast pathway and go up the fast pathway. And this can create a circuit going around and around like this. And this will cause a tachycardia that will be regular. In other words, there will be impulses traveling down to the ventricle that are fast and tachycardic and that occur at regular intervals. And this is most common in young women. The mean age of onset is about 32 years old. So in a board question, a person with AVNRT causing a PSVT is going to be most likely a young woman complaining of palpitations. I've cleared away my ink so I can show you one of the hallmark features of AVNRT on the ECG, and that is the presence of retrograde P waves. 
So when a person develops AV NRT and there is a circuit of electricity going around the AV node, that circuit of electricity will send electrical impulses down to the ventricle causing a tachycardia. But some electrical impulses will also go backwards up to the top, which is where the atria is. That will generate a P wave, but it will be a special kind of P wave called a retrograde P wave. So here is an ECG of a patient with AVNRT, and after each QRS complex, there is a little bump. That is a retrograde P wave. You can see one coming after each and every QRS complex, and that is a classic finding in patients who have AVNRT. The abrupt onset of a supraventricular tachycardia with retrograde P waves, that is AVNRT. So as I told you before, patients with AVNRT develop recurrent episodes of palpitations, and usually the episodes spontaneously resolve. But if the episode won't resolve and the palpitations are continuing, anything that will slow conduction in the AV node will break the arrhythmia. That's because the slow pathway already has slow conduction. So if you slow conduction further through the slow pathway, there will be no conduction and the circuit will break. So as I said before, imagine you have electricity going around and around in these dual pathways. Anything that slows conduction in the slow pathway will halt conduction here and that will break the circuit and sinus rhythm will return. And there are basically three ways we slow conduction in the AV node that you should be aware of for your boards. The first one is carotid massage, the second one is vagal maneuvers, and the third one is the antiarrhythmic adenosine. Adenosine slows conduction in the AV node, and so a person in the emergency room with AVNRT that won't break can be administered adenosine, and that will break the tachycardia and return sinus rhythm. As I said on the last slide, carotid massage is another way that you can slow conduction in the AV node to break the arrhythmia AVNRT. The way carotid massage is performed is the examiner presses on the neck of the patient near the carotid sinus. And what this does is it stretches baroreceptors in the carotid sinus. The stretch in those baroreceptors is going to be interpreted by the brain as high blood pressure. And when the brain thinks there's high blood pressure, it tries to decrease the sympathetic nervous system activity and increase the activity of the parasympathetic nervous system. That leads to more vagal tone, in other words, increased conduction through the vagus nerve. And since the vagus nerve innervates the heart and the AV node, this will slow conduction in the AV node. So hopefully you'll get to see someone do this clinically, but many times I've seen patients in the ER, they have an SVT and they're complaining of palpitations. I could administer adenosine, but what's easier to do is simply have the patient lie back, I press on their neck, and in a few seconds the arrhythmia breaks and sinus rhythm returns. Besides adenosine and carotid massage, vagal maneuvers are another way to break AVNRT. Vagal maneuvers are maneuvers a patient can do that increase tone through the vagus nerve. One of these is the Valsalva maneuver. So the way a patient performs the Valsalva maneuver is you ask the patient to bear down as if they're moving their bowels. This will increase the thoracic pressure and this will press on the aorta and slightly increase the aortic pressure. Just like we talked about with carotid massage, that will be interpreted by the brain as a rise in blood pressure, and the brain will respond with increased parasympathetic nervous system output that slows heart rate and slows conduction in the AV node. And all these things here can also be used as vagal maneuvers, and many patients who have AVNRT learn to do these things. They simply feel palpitations, and they do one of these maneuvers, and they make the palpitations go away. That is a way to manage AVNRT if the patient is able to do it. So any patient that has dual pathways and develops AVNRT can have the arrhythmia return, although for many patients the arrhythmia happens very infrequently and it's really not much of a problem. So most patients who have infrequent episodes need no therapy, but if patients are having recurrent episodes of palpitations from AVNRT, you can give them a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker like verapamil or diltiazem. All these drugs slow conduction in the slow pathway and they make it harder for the arrhythmia to develop. And then finally, this is rare, but there are patients who have refractory AVNRT that continues to occur despite taking one of these drugs. And for those patients, there is a surgical procedure where the slow pathway is identified and ablated so that it can't conduct electricity. And that eliminates the dual pathways and makes the arrhythmia AVNRT go away. I'll finish this video with one slide on AVRT, which is AV node reentrant tachycardia. This is another cause of a PSVT, and even though it sounds a lot like AVNRT, it's completely different from AVNRT. It's a different arrhythmia entirely. In order to develop AVRT, the patient must have a bypass track, which means they must have the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. By way of review, patients with the WPW syndrome have a delta wave on their EKG like shown here, and they have a short PR interval. So when a patient who has this type of EKG develops a PSVT, that patient most likely has gone into the arrhythmia AVRT, which is different from AVNRT.
The treatments for AVRT are similar but slightly different from AVNRT. It can be treated with AV nodal slowing agents and there are surgical options. But the main thing you want to know at the non-cardiologist level is that a patient who develops an SVT and has a prior EKG with a delta wave or who has the WPW syndrome, the most likely arrhythmia in that case is AVRT. And that concludes our module on ACLS and tachycardias.